Okay, I got the recording rolling, and I want to talk about what's going on in week three. And while we call it off-site publishing, we just mean not publishing on your own site, but publishing on other people's. So in the past, you have been keeping track of websites that you follow, writers or news agencies or public service agencies that you think have interesting information or corporations that you follow, uh, like Linda, I'm sure you're following music production companies, so that that kind of expertise that you have been reading them, now I want you to go out there and raise your hand and speak up a little bit at their place, not on yours. Now, the reason we do this is twofold. The hidden agenda, of course, is to draw attention to yourself and have people who visit the big site notice you and maybe come look at your little site so that you maybe pick up some followers or some readers because you are out there interacting with one of the big guys. I never knew, for example, that people were paying attention to me until I saw George Will was following me on Twitter. And that made me feel real proud and also scared because I didn't want to put anything dumb out there in front of somebody who <laughs> I've got a bunch of his books. But if you say enough of the right things in the right places, in the right way, you can draw good attention to yourself in the professional communities that you want to be a part of. So this is about teaching you how to hang out with the people that you admire, that you respect, and to get a little bit of that to come back to you. Now, that's the small agenda. That's just a side benefit. We're not doing this to create followers. The big reason we're doing it is because you already engage with these people because you read them, you're interested in them, you keep up with them. And I want you just naturally and professionally to add to the conversation. So, using the Ferguson, uh, Missouri example, I could just go to some site that was covering that story and say, good story, Bob. I really enjoyed that. Does that add anything to the conversation? Did I put anything substantial out there that other readers would care about or that reflected well on me that somebody would want to read what I said? No. Because all I really did was pat him on the head. That added nothing. Now, if I said, good story, Bob, I really enjoyed it. In fact, it reminds me of the 1990s after Oklahoma City when we were moving a lot of surplus military gear to state and local agencies, which is why they look like they got Army stuff, because it was surplus Army stuff. See, now I've added information that naturally goes with what Bob might have been saying about the militarization of the police. So I have added useful information that organically and naturally looked like it belonged on that thread. Now, if I had gone on a story about Ferguson and said, yeah, that reminds me of Hurricane Andrew, Hurricane's got nothing to do with it, right? I'm just pulling something out to uh, try and draw attention to what I want to talk about. And that is shoehorning myself into somebody else's story inappropriately. That would be like, it's like being at a cocktail party and people are talking about football and then you interrupt somebody and say, yeah, but I want to talk about hockey now. It's rude and it doesn't make you a welcome member of that conversation. Instead, you stand there with your drink in your left hand because you want your right hand to be dry and warm in case you got to shake hands with somebody. So you're holding your drink in your left hand and you're politely listening and nodding and waiting for a break in the conversation. And if something uh, you have an opportunity to add to it and say, yes, I saw him play ball in college. Oh, then uh, tell us about that. And you get invited into the conversation. That's how you would do it if you were at a party in a polite way where you were respecting what people were already talking about, and then you found your natural opening to get in on it. That's how we do it online when we go visit somebody else's website. Remember, it's the other guy's party. You're just a guest that they have invited to comment on their article 
or to retweet and comment on their tweet, right? So the fact that they have allowed you to engage and participate carries with it a little responsibility for you to be polite when you do it. So yes, in a small way, we're looking for places where you can show off and draw good attention to yourself. But we want to do it in a way that in the majority is polite, respectful, and add something of meaning to the conversation. I'm going to share with you a way that I did it to advance my writing career so that you can see what I did right, also some things I did wrong, but to give you a plan for getting yourself noticed in the right kinds of places. So, in military terms, we talk about having strategy, then tactics, then operations, and get smaller and smaller and smaller. So, in the 1980s, my strategy was to go from newspaper writer to best-selling novelist whose books would be turned into movies to make me rich and famous and get me on the Johnny Carson show. That was the big plan. I was going to be Tom Clancy before there was Tom Clancy. I was going to write action-adventure novels, and I was going to be an author-adventurer, and that, that was the plan, because I had these stories in me I wanted to tell. I had this knowledge. I thought I could tell it better in fiction. So that was the big deal. I was going to make that move from reporter to author and novelist. So the ultimate objective, the, the reason, and, and this is an insight into how men think, getting rich is not the objective. We get rich because that's how we keep score. That's how guys measure it against each other. You know, who's got a bigger car, bigger house, whatever, that who's got better seats for the football game. That's how you show off your status. That's how you be the, the bigger gorilla. So the reason we do this, it's a built-in competition. Um, so the ultimate objective was to be successful and happy. The way I was going to get there was going to be through my writing ability because I don't have musical talent or performing arts or any of those other things. I got to do it with something I know how to do. So tactically, how am I going to get myself into that area, the region of professional authors? Now, you could say I was a professional writer working for a daily newspaper, but that was not what I was looking for. I wanted to have paperback books and hardcover novels and big fancy magazine articles. So I needed to move a little bit from local newspaper guy to bigger publications, better attention, bigger paydays. Now, this meant that I wanted to do this in a way that I was supporting, see I said supporting objectives, to get to my ultimate objective of being an action-adventure novelist. So, if I'm going to do um, articles about military and espionage stuff that would support my writing novels about military and espionage stuff. So if I write some nonfiction articles for military technology magazines and things like that, I'm writing about airplanes and international affairs. That establishes my credibility so that uh, a, an agent or a publisher who was going to look at one of my books would say, well, yeah, he's written a lot of articles about this. That, that Those are good stepping stones to getting to write a book link thing. So I set out at my tactical level that I wanted to write articles for the big military magazines of the day so that I would start getting my name out at least in that area, right? So operationally, we're down to the uh, daily to-do list. What can I actually accomplish about this? Notice I said, think locally and do small actions. Uh, the Japanese call this Kaizen planning, where lots of small things eventually accumulate to a big thing. You know, a great stone wall starts with w one rock. So what could I do locally? What was a small thing that I could do to get myself into that big military magazine market? Well, I was doing PR work for the college and writing for the newspaper. I knew the PR people at the Air Force Base and the Navy Base. 
So I talked to them over lunch and said, look, I want to start writing for some of these magazines. What do you got that I could do a story about? Because they were looking for publicity. I was looking for stories to do. So I'm working my local contacts in my beat, and they started giving me some story ideas. Then I worked on writing those up and developing them and started selling them to the magazines. And usually I might sell one out of every four that I pitched, but at least I was getting somewhere. This is why we want you guys to start figuring out what your beat is so that you know who the key players are. You develop a contact list. I have never thrown away a business card till I typed it into my computer because I never know if I need to be in touch with somebody. I got a student right now from the 1980s that is a uh, director, not film director, but administrative director out at Disney in Los Angeles. So we, I have been keeping up with him. My best friend from high school now uh, works in a big uh, military consulting firm. So yeah, I keep up those connections. I stay in touch with people. Thanksgiving weekend, I do my Christmas cards to my personal and professional contacts. And those are small operational things that I can do to make sure my contacts um, stay fresh, that I keep up with people and know, know where they have moved to. Not just so that they can be of use to me. A buddy of mine from college just got a promotion at a TV station. I'm going to try and help him because he's now got to do the internet marketing for that TV station's advertising. So I'm going to try and use my expertise to help him out a little bit. Because all these favors, they flow back and forth. If I don't get a favor back from him, I'll get one from somebody else. I'll do one from him, and the universe will owe me a favor sometime in the future. So here's the summary. I wanted to, the wealth and fame. I wanted to publish novels. My medium-sized goals, my tactics, establish myself as an expert, start selling to the magazines. My daily operations... I contacted my buddies at the Air Force and the Navy bases to get some tips, and I started studying the newsstand to see what kind of articles we're getting in the magazines now. If I'm not writing the kind of stuff that they're buying, then I'm wasting my time and theirs. So this is stuff that you can do. This is why we have you already making notes of what websites you follow, why I ask who's your favorite writers, uh, where do you get your information? Who do you turn to for uh, technical knowledge? Because if you're following those people, you already respect them. You think they're, those are good news sources. That's the kind of people I want to be hanging around with. Even if I'm hanging around with them virtually on their message boards, I want to be involved with the best people at whatever my beat is. Whatever my racket is, I want to be around the number one people, not the number 10 people. So I needed to find out who my strategic publics were. Now, when I say publics, we, we consider that a plural because we segment the public into groups. So if you tell me your market is everybody, you don't understand your market. Your market is going to be some slices of society that pay attention to the kinds of things you want to write about. I don't think either one of you write a whole lot about military airplanes, so we probably don't share a market. That's my slice. It's not your slice. So for me, who were the people I needed to pay attention to? I need to keep up with my professional sources. So my buddies in the military need to keep up with them. My friends at FBI and CIA and big police departments who could be intelligence tipsters for me, I needed to keep up with them. I still get a kick out of it when I see somebody being interviewed on TV or if I see somebody in a documentary on the History Channel and I go, I know him. And <laughs> I, I get that little feeling that I was hanging around with the right people. But I got to keep up with the, the people who can feed me information that is useful to me. Now, once I collect that information, don't I also then have to have a place to put it? So... I have to know the people who are buying books, who are buying magazine articles. I had magazine editors that I could call if I had an idea for a story that was hot. I had some that would call me. 
I had one actually wake me up because it was summer vacation and I didn't have any classes. And I picked up the phone and I just heard somebody say, you speak French, right? And I said, who is this? And it was an editor up in New Jersey that I had saved his butt a couple of times by rewriting stories on short notice. He had a chance to get an interview with an artist from France who didn't speak English real well. And he wanted to know if my French was up to the challenge. And halfway, it kind of worked out. But the, but the point was... I had good relationship with him because I had delivered what he was paying for on time. So he knew he could trust my work would be efficient, and he could trust that he would get something from me that he could publish. So I was quick enough for him and good enough to get in his uh, magazine, and he was good enough to pay me promptly. So we became pals. He got what he paid for, and I got paid. But I also needed to have support people. I had relations with a couple of literary agents who guided me towards magazines and publishers that I might be able to work with. And even though I was teaching writing, I still went and sought out writing coaches at workshops. I showed my stuff to other professors and said, mark it up. Tell me what's wrong with this. Tell me if my story doesn't make sense. Because I had to humble myself to be able to be coached. So I commend you by being in this university program because you at least recognize you can still learn some things, and I'm glad that I am here with the rest of us to try and share what we have learned the hard way. But these are communities in which I want to move. I will tell you, for example, LinkedIn is a great networking place for this kind of thing because there are discussion groups for people who share narrow interests. So if I wanted to find a LinkedIn group that was all about literary agents, I would find people who have had agents, who were looking for agents, maybe people that are agents who were looking for new writers to represent. But in that discussion, you learn the tips and techniques, you get to ask your questions, and you can also uh, pick up ideas just from looking. But if you ask a good question, you get to participate. And sometimes you have a little answer to share where you can say, well, I learned this in one of my classes. Or you could say that um, you had a certain experience trying to write for some magazine, and this is what you learned from it. Uh, Very early on, I learned the difference between paid on acceptance and paid on publication. Paid on acceptance means they cut you the check as soon as they say they like your story. Paid on publication means you got to wait for the magazine to hit the newsstand, and that could be six months from now. So it's hard to make a living when you're not getting paid for six months. You got to have a lot of stories moving around. So, uh, and welcome, Scotty. Good to see you there. Uh, we're just talking about the week three uh, project and um, providing some background about it uh, based on my uh, own activities. So I want you all in this week's assignment, when you're looking for uh, websites to comment on, that you are picking organizations, you're picking discussion groups, you're picking notable people that are in line with what your goals are. Now, do do I follow a couple of my favorite bands on Twitter? Yeah. Do I follow a couple of my favorite ballplayers? Yeah. But I really don't spend a lot of time with that. Because mostly, I need to follow my military and intelligence and politics people because that's mostly what I do. So, sure, there's a couple of things I look at that are for fun, but we want to focus on business for this week's activity. So, leave your hobbies aside and uh, work on your market. Now that we got more people, I was getting some feedback off your mics, so I killed all your mics. If you got something to say, throw it in the chat window, please. Here are the five easy steps to follow to build a social media plan. And I do this, in fact, uh, when I open up Hootsuite first thing in the morning and I can scan across all my Facebook news feeds, my LinkedIn groups, and my Twitter feeds. I, I can see everything going on in about 30 minutes. 
First thing I do then is the listen stage where you aggregate content and information. Some of what you will do in this assignment is you're going to retweet high quality information from sources that you really respect. How would you know unless you're taking in a lot of stuff and sifting through it to find the good stuff from the weak stuff? So this news aggregation, kind of like putting together a, a package in Storify, where you grab a few good quotes, a few good graphics, a few good tweets, and you kind of string them together, that's part of what you're doing in your head. You're receiving all this information, and then you're sorting it out into the three or four that are really good. So what you're trying to do is, when you retweet, move stuff to your followers that is of high quality and high value. I read an article about this a while back that said one thing people really value in a good tweet. First, it has a link to more information. So use your feature to crush those long stringy links down to those short compressed links. So Bitly and things like that, Hootsuite will do that for you as well. So you can move that little bitty uh, uh, link but then your tweet or your retweet of somebody else's comment is that this is a good article about Ferguson, Missouri, or ISIS and Iraq, or uh, Israel and Gaza. So you got your key words in there so that I know what I'm getting if I click on that link. Second thing that it says is prepare, which is like staging your material off in the wings before you bring it out in front of the spotlight. I actually will sit and work on my tweets and edit them because I want to get the maximum out of my 140 characters, but I don't want to use all 140 characters. I'm hoping that somebody is going to retweet what I put out. So I got to at least leave room for RT space for them to retweet my thing. And I want to leave them room for a couple of words also that they can add to what I wrote. So I try not to use up all of the characters. Sometimes if one of you guys writes a good story and I want to share it, I will rewrite your tweet or I will shorten your headline just so I can add the phrase, a great story by one of my grad students, so that I'm putting my credibility out there with your story so that when I spread that around, my people don't know who you are, but they know me and they know that if I shared it, it went through my editing process and I must have thought it was pretty good. So there's a preparation process that I go through. I don't just click that retweet button because I thought it was good. I retweet with a comment so that I add a little bit of my insight or a little bit of my preview to get them to the story or the article or the document that I'm trying to share with them. The third step is to actually go ahead and post. If you're not moving stuff, other people are and you're falling behind them. So you take in the information or you write new stuff of your own, but you got to put it out there. And I am actually bad about this. I have to kick myself in the butt. I have to write myself to-do lists to remind myself that I got things I need to do to maintain my social media presence so that I'm going to put out a couple of comments a day or I'm going to share a couple of articles. Uh, I like to do maybe 10 things a day, every day. I think that's, that's how I kind of start my morning, flush my brain out, and then my brain is clear to do my regular work. But it's important that I stay busy and in a meaningful way. So having a bunch of good ideas and making a bunch of notes to yourself, that's one thing. But at some point, you got to actually put it out there. So don't be intimidated that, well, I don't know if I can post on CNN.com. They're so big and I'm so little. No, all those other monkeys are out there writing things. You should jump out there and have your two cents as well. But if your two cents is actually worth a nickel, because it's well thought out, it's well composed, and it makes a good point, people will pick you up. On LinkedIn, I have picked up a lot of followers 
simply because I was answering somebody else's question, gave them some good advice, and aimed them somewhere useful. And then suddenly, I'm getting a bunch of thumbs up, and people are wanting to follow me on LinkedIn um, because they saw other stuff that I wrote. And it's very surprising to me because I thought I was just being a good Boy Scout and sharing something I knew with a stranger that I thought would be helpful. Now, step four, go offline and meet these people. Every now and then, it's okay to pick up a telephone. If somebody is in the same city with you, meet them at Starbucks, get a cup of coffee. I will, on one of my academic sites, I point out when I'm going to be attending some major conference so that, it, you know, if I'm going to be in New Orleans at the educational research meeting, I let people who pay attention to me know that in case anybody else is going, we can catch up, have lunch, uh, talk about a research project or something. So um, the only way that works is if I actually become a real human to them. I've got a couple of sources overseas that I never got to meet in person, but I exchanged separate email exchanges with them outside of the public websites so that I can verify who they are and what they really are so that I can trust their information. So while the internet affords us lots of anonymity, when you find really, really good contacts, really good experts, you want to get to know them in person. Uh, Linda, that's why I commend you driving over to Nashville to go to that uh, convention. Sometimes you still have to get out there and wear out shoe leather and shake hands and uh, give away free keychains and do that kind of thing to do business. Now, number five, how do we measure whether or not you were successful? And the phrase, so what, is one that one of my professors at Florida pounded me with all the time, because I would come up with these great ideas, and then he would say, so what? Meaning, what difference did it make? So you wrote a great article, or you gave a speech at a conference. What did that mean? What did that accomplish? Did anybody's life change? Uh, did anybody go home and become a better professor because they heard you talk about teaching? Uh, what's different? And I think that is a big part of how we properly evaluate teaching. When you finish this program, so what? Are you able to go off and become a successful writer or video producer? Are you able to get a job? Are you able to use these skills to enhance your current job? I mean, what was the meaning of this process? When you come out of the end, if all you get is an expensive diploma, so what? In that same vein, if you go out and you post on other people's blogs, you go retweet people people or you tweet at people, so what? Are we really doing this just to increase our number of followers? The number of followers uh, is real easy to get because I can throw myself out there and have all kinds of timeshare and life insurance sales opportunities and all kinds of spam fill me up and make it look like I got thousands and thousands of followers. That's not what I want. Instead of a thousand of them, I'd rather have 10 people that were other journalism professors who were interested in what I had to share about 21st century journalism. Give me 10 good ones who really know who I am and what I'm talking about. I will value them much more than a thousand people who are trying to sell me aluminum siding for the house. So I, I can like all kinds of fast food restaurants, and they can fill up my inbox with coupons. Or I can actually have people who are real experts communicate with me as an actual person. I would rather have a few of them than all the Burger King coupons in the world. So when we measure the success of what you do this week, don't be hung up on whether or not your clout score increases or doubles because it takes a while to build up a following to build up an internet footprint. Instead, did you pick up a few people who shared one of your stories? Did you pick up a few people that liked one of your comments? That says you're doing the right thing, and like a snowball, this will eventually grow and grow and grow if you keep it rolling. 
So let's talk about how you build up your brand. We talked about listening, which is how you aggregate all this information. You take it in and then you process it in your brain and turn it into something new that maybe you do a story. Second thing is your home base. That's your website. That's what you're doing there on, on Bluehost. That's where you are hanging all of your material. That's where you have links maybe to organizations that you support. So uh, I, I might have a link to a charity that I support, like Shriners Hospitals. I could put that up just to indicate this is one of the things that I'm interested in as a citizen of the world, okay? Passports are the process of you joining other people's websites, signing up for other people's new newsletters, taking their electronic uh, uh, message boards, receiving their feeds. So uh, on LinkedIn, for example, some groups are closed and you have to join them and they approve your status that, oh, you are a music writer or you are a university student so that... Um, they check you out at least a little bit to make sure that you belong in with them and you're not going to try and sell people aluminum siding. Now, outposts. I think of this as when I write something for the Orlando Sentinel and I publish it on their website instead of mine. So I actually own a little bit of space on a big corporate website where I can put my articles. And there are other bulletin boards and things where I'm a member and I can put some comments out there. So what I've done is I've annexed that territory. Like when the United States bought Alaska, I added some more real estate. So I have more places to put my story than just on my own website. Now think about it. I can publish anything I want to on my own space. You know, I can take chalk and go draw anything I want to on my sidewalk. But if they want me, if I want to draw on somebody else's sidewalk, I need their permission. So they're going to look and see if I can draw any good or not. When you can put your stuff on other people's sites and they leave it there because they thought it was useful, they don't run you off, they don't block you, then that means you're doing something good enough to stay out there in the public realm. Number five, content. You have to produce something. So in your exercise this week, you'll have to go comment on a few people's websites, not of your own, and you're going to find articles, comment, and report them back to me on a form. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's informal. So when you put a comment on somebody else's website, remember, you're being a guest in their house. So you should make sure that your comment is carefully proofread, it's complete sentences, it's good grammar, it says exactly what you mean it to say, maybe you rewrite it a couple of times so that it's one really good tight paragraph instead of three rambly ones, because you respect being on their place as their guest that you at least want to make the best impression that you can. So your content has got to be tight before you put it out there. Then when you get into the conversation, that's when you get to share your ideas and your thoughts. And I think that goes hand in hand with number seven, that you consider yourself a member of a community so that you contribute something meaningful to the conversation. Don't just say something to hear yourself talk. Say something because you are adding a slightly new idea, another angle on it, another detail, something they may not have heard yet so that what you put in there has value. Number eight, when we talk about face-to-face -face and greeting people, I call people by name, for example, if I'm writing in a LinkedIn group, if I'm joining into somebody else's conversation, I'll say, you know, Jerry, I ran into that back when I was in college. I acknowledge that it was Jerry's original question or Jerry's original essay. So I am commenting back to Jerry. If I'm commenting to the person who is just above me on the thread, so Sally answered Jerry, and I want to talk to Sally, I'm going to say, 
Sally, I get what you're talking about. I don't understand this and this. Do you really mean? And, and then I ask my extended question to Sally to clarify for my mind and for other readers what she said when she answered Jerry. So just to be polite, I will name people to indicate where I am joining the conversation, who it is I'm responding to. Now, there have been a couple of times in the last few years where people got hot and they wanted to argue and I wanted to make sure that I was defusing the right person. So I would name a name. I would say, Sam, that's not what I meant at all. I apologize if you took it differently than what I intended. I was referring to this particular thing. And then usually that squares it all away and Sam is very happy and we wind up talking for two more paragraphs. But I think it is polite when you enter into somebody else's comment area, be it on a news article or a blog or anywhere else, be polite and greet people uh, so that you are cordial and you treat them like persons, not just a, a bunch of characters on a screen. Lastly, remember I said at the beginning, our small agenda item is to get people to notice us and follow us and read our articles. So in salesmanship, we call this closing, where I actually say, uh, what do I got to do to put you in this car today? Because I want to put you in this car today. I'm not letting you go home to think about it. I'm going to try and sell you the car before you get off my lot. So in message board terms, at the end of my paragraph, I got to sell you that I am interesting to read because you're not going to go looking for me. I got to give you a moment right there to close up with me and, and go to my website. I was reading a newsletter from a business analyst that I respect, and he was talking about the whole Washington Redskins name change thing that it probably ought to be altered by now. And I had written an article kind of like that a few months before, not just about the Washington Redskins, but about the Florida State Seminoles in a slightly different vein because I went to Florida State and I had some different ideas, not changing the name, but how to do it correctly. So I commented on that guy's article and said, I agree with what you said, John. In fact, I wrote an article that includes college sports a few months ago, and here's a link to it. So I previewed what I added to the conversation, and here's a link if you want to go look at what I read. So he or any of his readers could have taken a look at it. And what was amazing was, because uh, this guy, he is a business uh, contributor on Fox News and Business Channel, not only did he um, like what I said, he tweeted it to his 250, 300,000 followers. So if you actually do a valuable thing that adds to the conversation, you do it in a polite, respectful, professional way, not only do you get to hang it on somebody else's professional website, they may pick you up and spread you around to all of their fans. So as much as I think you guys should all follow each other and retweet each other's stuff to kind of multiply your effectiveness, you get one good hit like that from a top professional who likes something that you said, that could uh, really get you out in front of people all around the world. But you have to do a really nice job at the beginning for that to happen. Okay, uh, I'm going to turn the mics back on and see if anybody's got any questions about what all we went over tonight, if you're clear on what your task is for this week. We all good to go how I want you to act when you get out there in internet public? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that was very good. Yeah, because because yeah. you're not just being yourself, you're also being full sale university. Right. So 100%. you represent yeah. me and all of us as well as yourself. And you know, that, and that Dr. Thomas, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Now I was just going to say in reference to all this, this stuff that's going on in Ferguson, I've been tweeting quite quite a bit, but I've done done a lot of retweets uh, on from credible sources and but. Um, now I have, uh, you've put something in my brain now to, when I re retweet something, 
also put in, you know, slight comment for myself. But some of the retweets, some of the stuff is so long, I couldn't get anything in there from me. Right. So I might rewrite their tweet. I'll shorten it some. Or I might mm-hmm. take one sentence off of it so I got room to put a phrase on it of my own. Okay. But I'm still keeping the character of what they said. So that's a possibility. One thing that I will do, because I get a lot of uh, overseas news, Mm -hmm. is I'll take a look at it in my newsletter and my inbox. So I'm looking at the headlines. And I could just click on it right there and retweet that or share that on Facebook or LinkedIn, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I click the original link of the article, and I go to the source where it came from. Oh, See, I may be one of the few people you'll ever know that reads Israeli Homeland Security magazine. Mm -hmm. So I'll see that quoted in other people's newsletters, other people's email stuff. I go to the original article and read the article and decide, hmm, this is beneficial. And I share it from the original article rather than letting it pass through two or three sets of hands. Uh Uh-huh. But I go and look at it myself and make sure that that is a legitimate news site. Because I don't know everybody on the internet. They're not all personal friends. They don't come over for Sunday dinner. So I don't know who these people are. They could be maniacs. So I want to go look at that article. Just because they got a nice looking website, they could just be you or me that has a good design. Okay? Hmm. So I want to look at them. I look at their biography. Who is this person? Because, you know, I look at some stuff and it looks like legitimate military reporting. And it's some guy running a militia group from his mobile home, right? So he's not anything except some crazy person in overalls. And I'm not going to quote him. But if I hadn't done my due diligence and checked him out, not only could I pass on his bad information, but I also would have embarrassed myself because it would look like I wasn't paying attention. So if I see something that just looks too good to be true or too crazy to be true, yeah, I click through that link myself and I look over the original article, the original website, and then if I start having good confidence in it, then uh, I may tweet or share from that original item. Oh, wow, okay. Instead of... It's like if if you tweet a review of a book and you didn't read the book yourself, how do you know that that reviewer read the whole book or even knew what he was talking about? Remember when we had the Dick Cheney video that if you hadn't looked at that uh, video yourself, you wouldn't know that that reporter had twisted the story? You would just believe it. Oh, yeah. I remember that. Yeah? I remember that. So... Uh, I actually, I downgraded one of my students at Florida State because she wrote a paper. It was a very clever paper. She got Adolf Hitler and Orson Welles in the same term paper. So she was good. But she quoted a review of uh, Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. And I took off points for that because I said, this is Florida State. We got 10 copies of Mein Kampf in English and German in the library. Big square building, center of campus, all the sidewalks lead to it. You can't miss it. You need to go read the book yourself and tell me what it says. Don't trust somebody else to read it for you. And when you retweet, that's what you're doing. You're trusting that the person that you are retweeting is not an idiot. So unless you know that that's a verified account and that that is a top professional person with a good reputation... I would check out what they're saying, and then if the source information is good, I would tweet the source information on my own account, uh, not somebody else's. Okay. I don't. I, I don't. I, I guess I never thought about it that way. I don't want to. I don't want to be caught passing out bad information. Yeah, makes sense. So, Dr. Thomas, how do, when look, we're talking about the. Um, civil unrest here in the St. Louis County area and dealing with the situ- the um, um, riots and looting and everything that's going on in Ferguson. Now, a lot of the tweets that I am reading, is because I have a lot of news sources, so 
you know, like the networks and, lo and local news people here. So I see yeah. a lot of their tweets. So in terms of retweeting that, is that okay to retweet some of them because they're credible sources? You know, they're, they're on the scene right there when stuff is going on. Yeah, if you're getting something from KMOX or the Post-Dispatch, then you know those are legitimate outfits. Okay. Right? So you know that those are for real. Right. It's, it, it's just when it, uh, it's Joe Bubble 68. I don't know who Joe Bubble 68 <laughs> is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So, so if I if I can't check him out, I'm not sending his stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, I get it. Yeah. But hey, my Twitter handle is is real clever. It's Dr. Ron Thomas Jr. That's it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is me saying what I think about stuff with my own name and my own face. Yeah. So yeah. if I got guts enough to put it out there, I I, I checked it out. So I'm putting my credibility out there with my name because what Jim Croce say, I got a name that uh, I carry it with me like my daddy did. Mm -hmm. right? so they put me in the ground, they carved that on a rock, and that's all I got left. So uh, I got to take care of my name. Yeah, that's all you got. Okay, guys, go get them. Make me proud and uh, stay in touch if you got problems. All right? Okay, thank you very much. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.